Okay, so again, I wanted to introduce Pastor Caleb Cooper. Pa Cass Pastor Cooper is an amazing man of God, as well as a great patriot. And how many of you enjoyed his prayer this morning? Was that amazing? Okay. Well, you're in for a real treat now because he is going to bless you with his message today. And I want him to do a shameless plug for himself because I want him to tell you about all the ways you can get in touch with him and his ministry and everything that he's doing because I want to support this man. So, Pastor Caleb. Awesome. Hey, listen, we, we pastor New Hope Revival Church in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. We have multiple campuses, so... I want you to connect with us. If you can write this down, you can connect with our table. It's calebcoopermistries.com. And uh, we've got this powerful movie, Noncompliant 2, The Sheriff. They did, they did a movie about our strong stance, and we'll talk about that today. The book here, The Call for Strong Godly Leadership. How many know we need that? Strong Godly Leadership. I wrote the first 13 chapters. We invited law enforcement to come in I and write, and so you'll be totally blessed. The Sheriff wrote one of the chapters in there, and then this book here, Uncompromised Revival Fire, endorsed by Chris Ann Hall. How many know who Chris Ann Hall is? She's really the lead constitutional attorney in the nation. We'll actually get on an airplane in just a little bit. We'll be in Minnesota with her for the Shepherds and Sheriffs that's happening tomorrow morning. And so, CalebCooperMinistries.com, visit that, visit our table, partner with us. We have national assignments that are separate from our pastoral call. And so you may hear and see us doing many things across the nation. So work with us, partner with us, and let's do exploits together. We're going to roll just a one-minute trailer of the movie, and then I'll be right back with you. The voicemail was from the New Mexico State Police, and the officer said that New Hope Revival Church is non-essential and must shut down. I knew I needed to connect with the sheriff. I knew it was the chief law enforcement of the region. I remember uh, it, getting to attend a, a, a Chris Ann Hall uh, seminar in Albuquerque, and, and she had talked about the, the, the Shire Reeves. And I said, listen, I, I want to know if you'll stand for God rights. And he looked me right in the eyes, and he goes, Pastor, I will defend you even if it means I got to go to jail myself. Let's give God praise. How many know he's faithful? Let's try that again. How many know he's faithful? Come on. Listen, I got 15 minutes to say the most impactful things I can say to you, and so I'm going to move quick. I'm going to say a lot. We've got the sheriff piped in. He's going to be speaking the other 15 minutes. How many believe in honoring time and making sure that we do what we're called to do here? Acts chapter 5, I want you to just hear this verse. You might know it, but I want to talk to you about the freedom to stand, listen to this, in peaceful noncompliance in the last days. Everybody with me? The freedom to stand. And so here's the verse, listen to it, Acts 5, 27 through 29. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest and asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you to not teach in that name? I mean, no, that was that name of Jesus. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. In other words, modern day vernacular, I mean, he's saying a lot there, but to me, if I was to take the there and then and bring it to the here and now, biblically and theologically, that's called hermeneutics. Okay, you take what happened then and you apply it now, but go something like this. Did we not tell you to close your church down, but yet you continue to keep it open and you preach in that name Jesus in all of truth or consequences, New Mexico? Here was their response. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Let's say that again. Listen to me. We better obey God rather than man. And so I want you to hear this for just a moment because your freedom is under siege. How many know what I'm talking about here? This nation, everything that's going on, it's like the enemy has worked overtime to try to tie the hands of the church, incite fear into people, but God didn't give us a spirit of fear. Power, love, and a sound mind is what the Word of God says that his perfect love cast out all fear. And we know that fear is a chief operating spirit that will literally cripple the church if we're not careful. 
When everything went down with the lockdowns, I made a clear public declaration and multiple messages that the quickest way for this pandemic that has a virus connected to it, man-made from another nation, to destroy your life is to walk in fear because scientifically fear will reduce your immune system. I want you to hear me. So the people that got afraid got extremely more susceptible. We told our church it's against our religion to social distance. I know that sounds extreme, but Jesus said, go lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In the word of God, they had leprosy and they were required to stay within 150 feet to be quarantined because leprosy could literally transfer by the wind, but not Jesus. I mean, you know, he went and he laid hands and he did exactly what he's called us to do. And so we invited everybody to church, whether they had the virus or not. We opened the altars and we saw the power of God transform lives. We're talking about the call to stand. And so right now or recently it was a virus at some point it'll be something else but where I'm from if there's a nuclear attack we're gonna have church on Sunday morning I don't care if they come to church in an astronaut suit how I many know we're gonna preach the uncompromised Word of God we're gonna trust that the power of the Holy Spirit's gonna help us so listen to this we've got the freedom to stand this is what I'm calling you to this morning because God is raising up soldiers not sissies amen Three amens. I'll take a golf clap. Amen. Soldiers, not sissies. Look at this. Warriors, not wimps. Mighty, not flighty people that know who their God is. Daniel says those who know who their God is will do exploits. The righteous are as bold as a lion and the wicked flee when no man pursues them. And so we either believe this stuff or we don't. And so here's the challenge. I want you to hear this. We want real conservatives. How many want real conservatives? We want real Republicans, not rhinos. Okay, we want real, 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 but we keep giving counterfeit Christianity. There will not be a real America restored until we have real Christianity back in the church. Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. And so I was blown away during the lockdowns that people had healing ministries that shut down. How I many know that's an oxymoron, that you would have a healing ministry and then shut down when we need you? And I said to all the healing ministries, please stay shut down because you weren't open when we needed you. You're selling a false bill of goods. We either believe that Jesus Christ heals or he don't, and he heals even in the midst of a pandemic. So there will be zero excuse in the next wave to shut down. How many soldiers are willing to stand in the last days, having done all stand? Because that's what God's called you to do. So we want the real thing. I want to give you this warning here from William Booth. How many know who William Booth is? He's the founder of the Salvation Army. And he began to warn about this counterfeit Christianity. One of the reasons we're having such a, a war against the Constitution and the Constitution being under siege is because there's a war against Christianity. And we're finding in America that people think they can have any kind of Christianity they want, even if it violates the Word of God. And so if we're going to say this is all about God and it's all about Him and it's about His Word, how many think we ought to obey it? I said, how many think we ought to obey His Word? So listen to this for just a moment. Here's the warning. The chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost. He said there'll be Christianity without Christ. I mean, that's dangerous. Look at this prophetic voice. He said there'll be forgiveness. Everybody will say, you ought to forgive. Jesus forgives me. But there'll be no repentance. People won't turn from their wicked ways. He said they're going to call for salvation, but there'll be no regeneration, which means you've been brought back to life, where you become a new creation. Old things pass away and all things become new. So they'll speak of a salvation that they're going to go to heaven, but they won't have regeneration, where the life-giving power of God is instilled in the chambers of their heart. He also begins to warn there'll be politics without God. And then he said this, there'll be a heaven that is preached without a hell. How many want to turn this nation back to God? How many know we're going to have to get back to the authenticity? Not counterfeit Christianity, not chameleon Christianity that literally transforms in whatever atmosphere you're in, but you actually determine the atmosphere by the life of God that's on the inside of you. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So look at this, we've got that warning, but when this pandemic hit, let me just say this to you. My motivator was not the Constitution. I know that's many people's motivation. Maybe you're here for that. My motivation was not the strong stance that our sheriff did and walked in. We're going to hear from him in just a moment. My motivation for standing was not because I had all these pastors out there that said, hey, let's do it. 90% of the church is shut down. 
They're actually warning by 2025 and 26, we're going to see a mass shutdown. Because they shut down in 2020, they're actually going to reap the recoil of not being able to pay for their buildings and all kinds of craziness. So it was not the motivation of that. It was the motivation of the voice of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that began to speak to the chambers of my heart. I said, Lord, what do we do? The whole earth is shutting down. We've got pastors shutting down, whipping out, flaking out. We've got all kinds of craziness happening. And here we are as a church. What do you want us to do? And I heard these words. It was the voice of Almighty God as clear as a bell, like, just like I'm speaking to you. How many still believe that God can still speak in an audible voice? He can speak through dreams. He can speak through visions. But he desires to speak to his people. He said, son, you keep my lighthouse open. This will be known as America's great storm and America's great divide. I had no clue at the moment that it would divide families, it would divide churches. It would be one of the stormiest seasons that we would ever see in this great nation. But here was his words. Son, keep my lighthouse open. There'll be a great divide. And so God was speaking to me, but here's what I want to say about it. Everything he said was of the tone of peaceful non-compliance. Everybody with me? The voice of God came to me, and it echoed in this generation just like the Constitution would speak to us. See, if you're believing a document, but we haven't got to the foundation, which is the Bible, which is the chief operating documents that founded this nation, then you'll have a Constitution refusing to realize that it was inspired by the Holy Ghost. And so when we take a document and we try to apply it without true authentic Christianity, we don't have the voice of God backing it on the inside. We've got pieces of paper, just like many have treated the Word of God like it's a buffet line. I like this. I don't like that. I like this. I throw this out and I refuse to eat my spiritual Brussels sprouts. Even, you know how this thing goes, because we, 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 take, we take what we like, but we refuse what we don't. And so the warning here, look at this, God began to speak to me, and it echoed the sound of this, 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. How many still believe that? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. John 8.36, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So where does your freedom come from? It's not from coming to an event. We can have conference after conference. We say it's God-given rights. We say it comes from Him. But if we refuse to live that lifestyle, there's no way we can execute and weaponize what God said to use on the spiritual battlefield and become successful. We must have a lifestyle that begins to back it. And so I knew when I heard the voice of God, no one had to tell me it was in the Constitution, though I, was knew, it, I knew it was there. God was speaking in accordance to the Constitution because he inspired men to begin to write it. Everybody with me? The Word of God was the foundation. So when people came in that, they said, man, but God's speaking to us, Romans 13, out of context. I said, but God's speaking to me, Acts chapter 5. We will obey God over man. Everybody with me? We will obey God over man and so he would speak in accordance to the Constitution what is God saying to this nation the same thing he said in the Constitution that we must stand we must hold on to our liberties we must lay hold of our freedoms that are found in the Lord Jesus Christ again America has a threefold purpose preach the gospel support Israel and restrain evil no matter what 98 percent of all preachers on this planet came out of the United States of America a city on a hill and so we are the essential church. I got a phone call, you'll see it in the movie. Sheriff may refer to it in just a moment. But here was the words of the New Mexico State Police once we decided to stand, peaceful non-compliance, it says we're not closing. The voicemail said, New Hope Revival Church is non-essential and must shut down. But history records that Benjamin Franklin at the Constitutional Convention was unable to manifest even the realities of these documents and everything that would come together that would literally put together your freedom. He couldn't do it unless he literally called out for the clergy. They got on their faces, they began to pray, and it was the central church that founded our freedom. And so this antichrist spirit that's been loosed in the earth would literally release a language in the earth that goes like this, the church is non essential. See, the governments that are absolutely tyrannical are scared to death of blood-bought believers in Jesus Christ that will get on their face and say, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, he says, I'll forgive their sins, I'll hear from heaven, and I'll heal their land. 
And so they went to shut the church down first because they knew that if we prayed and we sought the face of God and we united, we would have a synergetic force in the earth. Synergy means multiplied power through combined force that were better together. And so the fear was really in them, so it was easily radiated upon the church. But we stood, and this is what I call you to, to stand. We're not here to just throw out empty words. Me and the sheriff that's about to come on, we went eight states last year together. How many know shepherds and sheriffs actually running together, developing and cultivating an atmosphere of freedom? Where we say, pastor, you've got to connect with your sheriff. Sheriff, you've got to connect with the pastor. But when I went to my sheriff's office, I, literally it was like the Holy Spirit was churning on the inside of my heart. That was a very constitutional call. Get to your chief law enforcement of your region. It was cold turkey. I didn't know our sheriff. You may not know yours. You better get to know him in the last days. I went literally, walked through, the, walked through the doors of the sheriff's office, sit down, begin to explain what happened, and you heard it on the video, exactly what was said. He said, Pastor, I will defend you even if it means I got to go to jail myself. When your sheriff is ready to wear a pair of handcuffs, we can mobilize freedom in this nation once again. When pastors rise up and say, I'm unafraid to speak on politics, Charles Finney, who led the Second Great Awakening, he said, if hell rules the halls of Congress, the pulpits of America are to blame. You may say, how did them people get in power? How did this happen? Because we stopped preaching the uncompromised word of God from the pulpits of this great nation. It will be the church that established this freedom and will maintain and sustain this freedom. Listen, I'm almost out of time and I want to honor that, but I want to say this. There's an antichrist spirit that's loose in the earth that wants to produce a one world government, one world religion, and a one world currency. Most of you have, who have any biblical foundation know that it's true. We're dealing with the spirit of the Antichrist now. At some point, there'll be a man. But I believe, listen to me, the church poses the greatest threat to the Antichrist beast system. We know the end will come at some point, but the church is still here. Jesus Christ has not sounded the trumpet yet. You're not dead yet. So you've got an assignment in this earth to make sure that we defend freedom and overthrow the powers of the Antichrist beast system. Let me give you an example really quick. Revelation 13, 16 through 18, you know it. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. And no one will be able to buy or sell unless they receive the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, which is 666. When 2020 hit, I don't believe the mask was the mark of the beast. I don't personally believe that the vaccine was the mark of the beast. However, those were precursors to control humanity, to control the church, to get us ready for what is to come. The first day they said I had to wear a mask, I said no, I've never owned a mask and I've never taken a free, a free mask from anyone without putting it in a trash can. You may totally disagree, but the day you can't buy or sell unless you put something on your face, America has lost its mind. And we've got an assignment to resist peaceful non-compliance that says, I'm not putting something with an unveiled face, I will behold the glory of God. I'm going to say it again. With an unveiled face, I will behold the glory of God. When that mandate came to our city, we did a peaceful non-compliance. We said, we're not doing it. I went to the chief of police. I said, I'm not doing it. He said, Pastor, listen, what's the difference in that and a seatbelt? I said a big difference because if I don't wear my seatbelt, you pull me over, you write me a citation, I go to the judge, they might defer it. But I can still feed my family. If I don't put on a mask, they're saying I can't walk on Walmart and feed my family. We shook the entire police force. We shook the Walmart store manager. I sat him down and said, this is an antichrist beast system. If you literally cause a citation on anybody in our church, we'll take legal action and we'll put a national spotlight on this little city and we will shake this thing for the glory of God. They had a list for our entire church. Pastor Caleb, okay, it's against his religion to wear a mask. It's against, and they just kept going. The same went with the vaccine. We wrote 300 religious exemptions. We've got the template for it in this book, Uncompromised Revival Fire, endorsed by Chris Ann Hall. We wrote a religious exemption for 300 workers, saved their jobs from the FBI to the military. People who make the missiles were contacting us. When I got the first call from the FBI, I thought they were out to get me. And they said, Pastor, I just want you to write a religious exemption for me. I don't want to take the jab. Pastors can move this thing. 
Shepherds and sheriffs working together in one mind and one accord can shake this thing. We had some victories. We're going to bring on the sheriff. We got, we got the sheriff ready just to make sure in the back. Sheriff, we got him ready? Okay, we're going to bring him on. Here's the victory. <clears throat> when we stood, and you'll hear it from our sheriff, he stepped in. I, I received a cease and desist order on Mother's Day. We were interrupted. Our meal was interrupted. Police knocked on our door, demanding that we shut down. And I had one document in my hand that shook the New Mexico State Police and even our governor, that our sheriff had deputized our entire church. Come on, how many know that's America's best sheriff? Right there. We had over 400 people converge on our cities. We had national news trying to connect with us. We had a two-mile parade where people came to support. Our voice is getting louder. A movie was made, all because we just stood. I had no clue. I just refused to shut down God's church when people needed the church. And look where it's taken us. And so there's a story that God wants to write about your life. What is your participation in the call to freedom in the last days? Books have been written, religious exemptions, and the story continues. So I want you to give it up really quick as we bring him on, Sheriff Glenn Hamilton, the other side of this story, so that we can hear his voice. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to first want to say uh, I apologize for uh, leaving Pastor Cooper up there on the stage all by himself. Uh, we normally attend these things together, but uh, uh, because of another engagement, I've been uh, forced to um, uh, to be up in uh, Des Moines, Iowa uh, today, and uh, and I appreciate the folks there uh, letting me appear uh, uh, via video. Um, I kind of want to carry on with uh, with Pastor Cooper's message there. I want to talk to you today about a higher authority and why it's extremely important that your sheriff not only know that he or she is the higher authority as it pertains to law enforcement and as being the chief law enforcement uh, uh, officer within the, the, the county, but to also share with you the importance that that sheriff also knows that he has a higher authority which he has to answer to. Can you imagine uh, my surprise? You know, my day was going pretty good aside from these orders, um, emergency orders that were coming in from the governor, uh, almost two and three a day uh, amendments that were coming in as to restrictions, shutdowns, lockdowns. Can you imagine um, sitting at your desk, if you're a sheriff, and having an individual like Pastor Cooper walk in and sit down in front of your desk and challenge you on whether you knew or not whether you answered to a higher authority. Now, fortunately for me, I grew up in the church. As a result of growing up in the church, I knew that I answered to a higher authority. God was going to be my judge. God was going to be my guide through life. So when Pastor Cooper sat in front of my desk and said, I just got a call on the church phone that said, we've got to shut down. And the governor, we knew it was coming. We suspected it was coming. And it came. I actually had to run into my IT guy and have him download the latest uh, amendment, and it confirmed that, in fact, yes, uh, the governor had told all churches across the state of New Mexico that they were to shut their doors and that they could no longer exercise that guarantee, that safeguard uh, that was put into the First Amendment by our founding fathers. See, our founding fathers also knew that they had a higher authority that they answered to, and it was why they put the the they drafted that document in the manner in which they drafted it. It was Judeo-Christian values uh, that uh, that they believed in that helped them draft that constitution. That and a vast plethora of knowledge from, in, from individuals that came from England in the old school and knew about the Magna Carta and knew about government in general and the overreaches of government. 
and how our governments are prone to overreach. Chris Ann Hall has an entire uh, teaching uh, um, presentation that she comes in, and we've had her down in New Mexico a few times for our sheriffs, uh, where she talks about the office of the sheriff and the importance of the sheriffs knowing where their history is and why they have the responsibility they do. Many of you know that are here today, and if you don't know, then I'm here to tell you. Your sheriff is the authority in your county. And the reason that the sheriff is the authority in your county is because he's elected. He is the only elected law enforcement agent in your state and in your county. Your chief of police is appointed by your local city councils. Your, your chief of the state police is appointed by the governor. So again, they are beholden to that higher authority, which put them in office. So there's a hierarchy that we have to, as a sheriff, we must recognize and we must, um, we must demonstrate from time to time that we have that knowledge. One, that it's God that I answer to. And it's those individuals, my constituency in my county, that put me in office and elected me. So when I had the pastor sitting across my desk saying that, well, we have a governor that just issued an emergency order shutting down our churches, I knew that I didn't answer to the governor. I knew that the governor of our state had the authority to direct her state agencies, but not the county agencies. She did not have the authority to direct the sheriffs to enforce her orders. There's a specific clause in the New Mexico state constitution that actually says when a governor issues an emergency order during a time of crisis, that it's only valid for 14 days. And within that 14 days, she must convene the legislative body in order to codify anything that needs to be long, long term or past 14 days. This had this order when it came down, I believe, was we were in the 18th to 20th day. So again, when I had the pastor sitting across the desk from me saying, Sheriff, we've got to shut the church down, or the governor's telling us we're going to shut the church down, but I'm telling you, I'm not going to shut my church down. So as your constituent, as a citizen of the county who put you in office or assisted or helped put you in office, voted for you, I hope he voted for me. I don't know, he may have voted for the other guy. Irregardless, when he's sitting across my desk, he can be very, it's very, very influential and very convincing. You just heard him today. I, I purposely had him open uh, our, our commentary today because I wanted to know, I wanted you to know just how passionate this man was about God and how God works through Pastor Cooper. Because I can tell you, he lit a fire in me. So when we sat down and said, okay, well, Pastor, I'm not going to allow them to shut your church down. See, there's a higher authority over state law. The governor kept saying that there's a thing called the Emergency Powers Act that was passed by the legislative body in New Mexico that gave her the authority to issue emergency orders and to dictate her state agencies do certain things, from the health department to the state police. Even the attorney general's office attempted to get involved in it. But I knew that there was a higher authority to that, even the state law that gave her whatever temporary powers that she had. There's a supreme law called the Constitution of the United States. And that that trumps even all of the state laws, especially when those state laws conflict with the wording in the Constitution. Now, we, Sheriffs will, will get this argument or will get this uh, blasted back at them. That who are you to determine what's constitutional and not constitutional? Isn't that supposed to be done by a, a five to, to, to nine robe, uh, individuals in black robes uh, that stand up and make a determination as to what, uh, uh, what violates the Constitution and what does not? I'm going to tell you where, where our argument on behalf of the sheriffs come from. And that is that in every state, in every elected office, when you take that office, you are required to raise your right hand 
and take an oath. A promise. An oath that says, I do by solemnly swear that I will uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state to which I am elected in. Another hierarchy there. First and foremost, the Constitution of the United States. So if I must take an oath that says I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, doesn't that stand to reason that I have some kind of knowledge as to when I'm violating that or when the law that has been passed in a, or an order that has been sent down is in violation of it? That is where many sheriffs start to relegate their power or delegate their power to another higher authority, the state police. I'm not subordinate to the state police. I'm not subordinate to the governor. I'm not subordinate to anyone but to my constituency and to God. And until our sheriffs actually start to understand that and to know that, not only after they're elected, but before they're elected to office. If you have any desire in your heart whatsoever to run for office or you are currently a sheriff, you have got to know what the hierarchy is. You've got to know what that higher authority is. You are the highest authority within your county, but God is the higher authority in your life, and he must dictate all of your actions. So I prayed about this. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And God sent me the answer. As I was looking through the governor's order, the governor's order indicated that public safety and first responders were exempt from the mass gathering restrictions in her order. And I said, well, wait a minute, but this, if this COVID thing was going to be the killer that it was, that it was played out to be, and, and I'm not trying to downplay any of the uh, the deaths that, that resulted from that, um, again, our hearts go out to, to anyone who was who fell victim uh, to this disease. But the reality was, if law enforcement was expendable, then why would a individual citizen who was willing to take whatever the risk or had whatever belief system uh, that God would, would get them through this, why would they not be able to exercise that free choice as well? So all I did was just went forward and assisted the, uh, the pastor and his congregation. And I used a tool in the sheriff's toolbox. It's called Posse Comitatus. You guys have probably heard this. It's called the power of the county. And we've seen it in the westerns play out uh, uh, scene after scene where the bank robbers rob the bank and, and they all ride out of town. And uh, the first thing, of course, everyone says, Sheriff, you've got to gather a posse together. It's basically the sheriff using the local citizenry and his local constituency in which to assist him in the preservation and the conservation of the peace within his county. She wrote a, a provision in her order that said public safety and law enforcement were exempt from the mass gathering order. So it was pretty easy. Uh, the Lord, it was like it was highlighted. The Lord showed it to me right in the, uh, in the order. And so I met with the, with the pastor and I said, uh, get everybody that wants to continue going to church, uh, to church this next Sunday. And uh, we, he packed the place out. I hope that he had, uh, that was his regular uh, crew there, but uh, um, it, was, uh, it was quite the crowd. And I deputized every soul in that room and made law enforcement out of them. Of course, you could, Imagine the backlash that I had, not only from some of the, the local um, individuals who were in support of the, of the mandates, uh, but even from some of my own elected uh, officials, uh, county commissioners. Um, but again, they understood the hierarchy as well. They understood that there was a higher authority and that we were, in fact, uh, uh, following that higher authority. And, and following the mandates and using the tools that are in our box out there. I cannot stress the importance today, how important it is that if you have someone running for sheriff in your county, get to know that individual. 
It is one of the most important elected offices in your county. Get to know that individual. Make sure that first and foremost, he is a godly leader. Because without God, there will be no leadership. The leadership will go, uh, go astray easily, very easily. And when faced with a situation like this, you have the supreme law enforcement authority in your county who now has nobody to turn to if he doesn't know God. It's extremely important, again, that you know this individual, you get to know them. If you have a sheriff that's newly elected, get to know that sheriff. Make sure that their priority is God and the Constitution. I would like to thank uh, everybody here today uh, that uh, put this on, uh, Sheriff Mack. Uh, again, I apologize for not being able to be there with you today. Um, but again, I hope you take this message. If you haven't seen Noncompliant 2, the sheriff, uh, please pick you up a coffee. It's very, very powerful, and it, it pretty much lays out, uh, it lays out that authority. Again, thank you all very much. Uh, have a uh, wonderful rest of your day, and uh, God bless you all.